And I get to skip around from things like Benedict Arnold and the American Revolution. Have you heard of him? Do you know what he's famous for? You ever heard of him? He's, if, one, if people know one thing about him, it's that he was a traitor in the American Revolution, which is like the worst thing you can do, right? Uh, but his story is just a really cool action-adventure, nonstop, over-the-top action story. So I like that, because if people think history is going to be boring, I like telling stories like that. To, um, to Lincoln's grave robbers, that's really weird. Did you know, has anyone heard this, that... Uh, it's a true story that some counterfeiters in Chicago tried to steal Abraham Lincoln's body. You're shaking your head. You know about it? Really? Wow. Uh, that was amazing. And again, if, if, um, if I'm speaking to students and they haven't heard it, it's a fun story to tell because it's, it's, uh, it's a true crime story that people think I'm making up, but it's not true. It, it's, it's totally true. It's really well documented. These guys really wanted to get one of their colleagues out of prison, so they thought it would be a good idea to go to Illinois, Springfield, Illinois, where Abraham Lincoln was in a tomb. Um, dead, obviously, and they, they thought if they could take the body and hold it hostage, they could make a deal with the government. Does that seem like a good plan? <laughs> it's a terrible idea, but it makes for a good story. And then to more serious stories like Bomb, which is a, a World War II story about the making of the atomic bomb and all the spying that went on behind the scenes. And when I was researching that, I found this really little known story about a place called Port Chicago, a civil rights story about some, this was a Navy base in California. And the story is about some young sailors who were sent there, and it was totally segregated. And after a huge disaster took place at the base, these guys stood up against the segregation in a really dramatic way and were actually charged by the Navy with mutiny for it. And it led to desegregation of the Navy, though it's not famous at all. I really think of it as one of these early sparks of the civil rights movement, even before some of the more famous things, like even Jackie Robinson or certainly Rosa Parks. And so I really wanted to tell that little known World War II story. And then the most recent one I'll talk about a little bit, most dangerous, from the Cold War, the Vietnam era. And there's always one little thing that gets me into a story. And if I can reach it, since my remote wasn't working. Unless, David, do you want to help me? Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's working now. <laughs> Thank you. You made it work. Yeah, I'd like to go back. I could just go. Can you tell which one's me in that picture? Can you see? That's me and my brother. <laughs> That's right, the one with the curly hair, not the one with the bowl hair. But I like to show that because this is when we thought of becoming, do you guys have an idea of what you might want to do one day for a job? You do? Like what? What, what do you think? That's really serious. How about you? Inventor, oceanographer. Yes, what about you? Magician. And I know my daughter wants to be an inventor too. What do you think, David? What are you thinking about? You haven't decided. But when we were that age, we kind of, we really wanted to make movies. That was our thing. And I'm not going to talk about that, but it's just kind of to point out that I, this kind of strange past to, to getting this job. Um, here we are making our movie in Austin. We, we saved up all our money and we tried to make a movie and it was a total flop. And in a weird way, it worked out to be a good thing, if you can believe that, because uh, we just, I really still wanted to be a writer of some kind. So that's when I moved to New York 
Oh yeah, the review, if anyone wants to see the review of the movie. See the, um, if you think I'm exaggerating, look at the star situation down there. <laughs> it did terror, it was really bad. I'm not gonna go into that today, but that's when I started writing about history. I got this job writing for a textbook company, which I really thought was incredibly boring, but I kept finding these cool stories, like the ones that I've been telling today, and it led to this, to this career. And with this book, uh, does this look like an exciting piece of equipment? Not really. This dent but I saw this picture. This is what got me into the story, this dented filing cabinet. And what I learned was that the government had tried to break into this cabinet. This is in a doctor's office in Los Angeles. And it started to sound like a kind of a true crime story, which I really like. And what happened was that these guys working directly for the White House tried to break into this filing cabinet to steal documents to destroy this guy in the middle, Daniel Ellsberg, and he's the main character in the book. As a matter of fact, that's what really got me. Wh what would this guy have had to have done, because I didn't even know the story that well, to have provoked this wrath from the president, no less. This is coming straight from the White House, which is obviously an incredibly illegal operation to break into an office to steal files, because they really wanted to destroy this guy any way they could. And this kind of explains that this is, Henry Kissinger was the president's top advisor, and he said, Daniel Ellsberg, who's the main character in this book, is the most dangerous man in America. He must be stopped at all costs. And that's where the name Most Dangerous comes from. So it's the story of what he did in this book. Oh yeah, that, this, is a, this is a cool little Lego animation that my daughter and I did about it. But I won't show that right now. The point is, uh, I start with that question. What could he possibly have done? And it's his story. He started out when the Vietnam War began, he started out as this really hardcore Cold Warrior. He really believed in the war. In fact, he'd been in the Marines, and so he worked right for the people who were planning the war, and he was very pro-war. But right from the start, he saw that, well, to put it bluntly, he saw that the government was lying. He saw, because he would see the true uncensored classified documents that would come in from Vietnam in his office. And then he would hear the things that the president was saying to the people, and they were totally different. So right from the start, he saw that. But he didn't mind at first, because he thought, well, we're on the right side of the Cold War. So he thought, well, I guess this is just what governments and presidents do. They just lie to the people, and that's, that's OK, because they're doing it for the right reasons. This is what he thought. And then the story is about how, over the years, he began to change his mind. And he ended up going to Vietnam for a couple of years. There's, a, there's so many great things in it that you just couldn't make up. There's a great romance in the story. He met a young journalist he really liked. Her name was Patricia Marks. And she, he really wanted to go out with her. And she came down to Washington, where he lived, to cover a peace march, the first peace march of the war. And he wanted to ask her out, so he called her. And she said, well, I'm a little busy. I'm covering this peace march you know, at the White House. And, uh, but if you want to see me, you can come. And he need, she needed someone to hold her tape recorder. He said, you can come hold my tape recorder, if you like. And he said, I can't come to the peace march. He was, working, he was actually working at and even calling from his office in the Pentagon. So can you imagine how awkward that would be if he gets seen at a march? But he liked her so much that he went to it, that he went to the march, and it was kind of their first date. And he said he spent the whole time like this, just hoping no one would take a picture of him that could show up in the Washington Post and ruin his career. But she's a great character in the, in the book because uh, she really was a little bit of, I think, his conscience a little bit. She pestered him all the time. How could you be doing this? That was the big question that she would ask. He said, yeah, but we're on the right side, so I'm do I know we're doing a lot of bombing and, and causing a lot of destruction, but it's all, we're, our hearts are in the right place. And th that caused a lot of fighting back and forth. But eventually he went to, he was just the kind of guy who had to see things up close. He's a very intense dude. And he went to Vietnam, he spent two years there, he even went out on patrols, went out on combat missions. And when he came back, he was very, very disillusioned. And that's when he started seeing a psychiatrist, uh, which was the, the filing cabinet that I showed. So he started seeing a, this doctor he was just so disturbed. But also, he was still this really trusted insider, so he had access to all these top secret documents. And that's, this is the midpoint of the story. I love these kind of what do you do moments. He, he had all these top secret documents that ex would, could expose all the lies that he knew um, the people, he felt anyway, that the people needed to know. The war was continuing to escalate. Nixon had just been elected, who wasn't, clearly wasn't going to end the war anytime soon. And he just was ready to do anything. He was really ready to risk his life, to burn all the bridges, to betray every friend he ever had. He knew there was no going back, and he'd probably spend his life in jail. But the decision he makes right in the middle of the story is to begin copying 
these papers, which became known as the Pentagon Papers, and try to figure out a way to make them public, to expose them to the country. And that maybe would shock us into forcing the government to end the war. That was what he was hoping. And so that's right in the middle of the story. And then the second half is the incredible blowback from when he did this. It showed up in the New York Times. He, the government declared him the most dangerous man in America and went after him with everything they had. And this is where the filing cabinet comes in because they found out that he had seen a psychiatrist and they said, well, if we can steal those files, this is coming right from the White House, if we can steal those files, we'll expose them. There must be embarrassing stuff. He must have told this doctor really embarrassing things. So we can steal that stuff and expose it and ruin it and no one will pay any attention to him anymore. They tried that. They tried beating him up. They tried putting drugs in his soup. Um, they had, they got LSD and they, they were going to put this really powerful drug and they were going to put it in his soup before he had to make a speech just to try to make him look like a fool. They were going to do anything to destroy him. And so that's the second half of the story and how it all just blows up and leads directly to Watergate and the, the end of the Nixon administration and in a very indirect way to the end of the Vietnam War. So that's the story in a nutshell. I'd be happy to go on or take some more questions, but I'm going to turn it over now. Thank you. Did you want to show anything? No. Okay. Well, I'll turn that off. Thank you. I guess what I'll do is I will. Uh, they wanted me to hold a mic. Okay. I do. A, I will do two readings. Um, and there are little children here. So why don't I first talk about uh, why I wrote this book? This this is a book about my father's um, adolescence, his journey. I did a book prior to this, which was Malcolm Little, The Boy Who Grew Up to Become Malcolm X, and it's a children's book. It's an illustration book. And it's, I think, a beautiful book because it celebrates for young children uh, leadership, self-love, um, all of the good things about family, um, about education, making good choices at a young age. And then you see how um, Malcolm's father was killed and then his mother was put in an institution years later, so she didn't have a nervous breakdown. Um, but she was put in an institution, which is what they did to a lot of women back in the 1920s. It didn't matter, you know, if you were African American, white, you, you know, they just, if some men were finished with you, they just took you and put you in an institution, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and so then his siblings, were separated and Malcolm went to a detention school, uh, a detention, and while in that detention, um, he still excelled in school. He loved learning because of those, those were the values that were instilled in him as a child by his mother. His mother was um, um, the national recording secretary for the Garvey movement, which back then commanded millions of followers, and, and so it was called the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And his father was the Midwestern chapter president of that organization. And he would go out. He advocated uh, independence, self-reliance to the former enslaved Africans. And um, again, that organization commanded millions of followers. And so he would take his young son, Malcolm, with him. And, and Malcolm, of course, would see his father as this invincible man, this very um, person who would stand up for those people who did not know how to voice the, uh, the, 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 the inequities um, that they were living and the conditions in which they were living. And so he saw his dad in a very invincible uh, manner. And so when he was killed, it was traumatic, but he, no one ever talked about 
how do you feel? And so while Malcolm was in the 12th and the seventh grade, we see that he's very smart still and that he becomes the class president. So he was charismatic. He was the only African American in his class. And um, so during that time to be voted class president, you know, said a lot about his personality. And I, I usually tell people that oftentimes when you have many siblings, you, 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 you know, you become humorous, you become charismatic, you, you know, you, it shows you how to be good friends, good, a good brother, a good sister to your siblings, and a good friend to, friend to many others, as opposed to sometimes we see single children, you know, kind of in their own little world. <laughs> but, um, so we see that about Malcolm, and so when his seventh grade teacher says to him, what do you want to be when you grow up, and he says, I want to be a lawyer, um, again, it speaks to the character, this person, um, Malcolm the Child, because, um, you know, he could have said, I want to be a fireman, I want to be a police officer, I want to be an athlete, but he says, I want to be a lawyer, and so that was how he saw his father, and that's how he saw himself, being able to go out and defend people, you know, to articulate it, all kinds of things uh, for them. So he becomes the class president, his teacher says, no, you can't be a lawyer when you grow up, you have to be realistic, you're an N, and that was, you know, pretty, pretty traumatic for him. And not to have parents or someone to say to him, it's okay, Malcolm, you are smart, you can still love education, you can still excel, you can do these things. He internalized it and, you know, was just a person, he was in pain. And so when his big sister came to pick him up for a visit in Boston, coming from this rural, Midwestern small town um, in, Lan in Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. Um, Malcolm went to Boston and he saw all of these people. He saw the big lights and um, he saw African Americans, uh, you know, excelling, having fun. And he was just so lured by it that he decided that this is where he wanted to live. And while in Boston, he began making not the best choices for himself because, again, there was no one to say, Malcolm, you must focus on school, Malcolm, you know, all of these different things. And so my father um, ends up spiraling out of control. And, you know, this book does speak to young people. Sometimes we find ourselves when we are a lot younger, but most people in here look like they're about 15 years old. <laughs> we find ourselves at crossroads in our life but when we're in pain, we don't always make the right decision. We usually go for the decision that says that we're not worthy, you know. And so we see that that's what my father does. But in this book, you see him battling between right and wrong because he does know the difference because his parents told him right. And even though, it, it, but he makes the wrong decisions. And we see that, he, you know, the more decisions, the more he, you know, he just spirals out of control. And so it, it speaks to the importance of talking to our children and um, giving them direction. So I just, I will read a particular, well, the, the opening, so you see where Malcolm is. Friends tell me trouble's coming. I ease out of the restaurant, onto the sidewalk, gun in my pocket, hands in there too, keeping it close for good measure. I gotta get back to my pad and quick now, one foot in front of the other, keep my head down, hope no one sees me. Hey, Red, someone says out of the shadows, I flinch, flick my fingers on the metal. Detroit Red, they call me, though Michigan seems far behind me now. Hey, Red, I heard Archie's looking for you. West Indian Archie, the numbers runner I work for. My pulse beats firmer under my skin. Oh, yeah, I play it cool, keep moving. Half strangers know? Hell, rumors don't lie. West Indian Archie's mad. He says I wronged him, but I didn't. Excuse me. You'd have to be out of your mind to try to cheat a guy like that. Archie, a door slams somewhere along the block and I jump about a mile. A voice calls out, but not to me. I clutch the gun in my pocket and scurry on. How did it all go so wrong? When I first set foot in Harlem, I was a step ahead of everything. I could blend in with the jive cats, swirl the Lindy ladies, let my finger feet groove, think of nothing but the now. I could close my eyes and in closing them, not be seen. 
slip into the seams of the streets and let them swallow me. It was a glorious fit, so seemingly warm. The slick, savvy streets of Harlem welcomed me. I've made friends here, a life here, a whole world opening up. But now I've messed it all up, in a big time way, no going back. Cop car comes rolling around the corner, real slow. Damn, gotta get out of sight. In the middle of the block, there's a bar I know. Might be best to get inside now. Hey, Red, the bartender says first off. Archie's looking for you. He's good and steamed. Watch out. My life flashes before my eyes. Every place I've ever known. Every face I've ever loved. Everything I've ever done. And it all seems like a dream now. As if in any minute, I'll wake up in my childhood bed in Lansing, Michigan. And I'll be five years old with Papa still alive. And Mom home and smiling. Her arms open wide to hold me. But Sammy's voice is what's real. Red, you hear me? Red. Here and now, I don't want to be Detroit Red. I want to slip the skin of this life to be new and clean again. Just start over. I've done it before. I slide my hands over my smooth conch, down to my neck bone, fingers locking tight. It isn't me thereafter. It isn't me who's here. Red, Red. No, 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 not Red. I am Malcolm. I am Malcolm Little. I am my father's son. But to be my father's son means they will always come for me. They will always come for me, and I will always succumb. And so you see during this journey, during his adolescent journey, he's fighting his feelings of abandonment by his dad. And he's fighting the insecurity of what his life means as a young black man. And so especially during the 1930s, we get to see what it's like, and we see that it's not much different today. So I'm just going to forward a little bit. He comes up to me real graceful. OK, this is a dream, actually. I think it was a dream. I think it was. It must have been a dream. It's been so long since I've seen my father in a photo, in my mind's eye, anywhere. He comes up to me real graceful, his hands so large, reach for my shoulders. They cut me, cover me, cure me of some long-held ache. Papa, I whisper. The words flow forth from him, unending, not a sound to be heard, only the feeling of words, warm and soft like a blanket, rough as wool at the same time, scolding and healing, scalding and holy, like the touch of the brother's distant God. I've gone wrong. I've done wrong. Papa, I whisper. I'm sorry. There's no punishment in dreams, maybe. I wet, wake, sweat cold and starving, a soul deep hunger that I've never known how to fill, a line of powder, a line in the sand, a line between the things I know and the things I can't begin to understand, the things that threaten to consume me. I receive a return letter signed by Elijah. The words pour into me, begin to fill me in a way unlike any of the words before them. I feel new but his words don't. They thrum inside me at a comfortable pitch, plucking strings of my soul in places I haven't tried to reach in a long time. Up, up, you mighty race. It's not what he writes, but it's what I hear. Black is strong. Black is holy. We must rise up again. Be proud. Be wise. After I hear from Elijah, Reginald's promise of escape begins to make more sense. It begins to seem that the world is not finished with me. It does not matter who you think you've been up until now. Go forth as a child of God. It does not matter who you've been up until now. I roll these words around in my head. I've been so many things. Son, brother, Negro, Malcolm, nigger, red, homeboy, Detroit red, 22843. Look what has become of me. A number is all I am now. The number erases all that has gone before, stamps it null and void. In the end, I've become a nameless thing. And what this letter seems to be saying is that I can put aside the number now, too. I can rise out of this prison hole to become a man of my own choosing. I keep my head down as the guards walk past us, shouting. But I no longer hear them. They think it's enough to make me stand in this row with the others. They think it's enough to bind us in the same coarse cloth. My, my, my body obeys. My mind rebels. 
This place, these walls, they don't contain me. That is Elijah's message to me. My mind, my soul is greater than anything that can bind me. I was right all along. I cannot be contained. I don't have to be 22843 anymore. I can see it now. I can look into a proper mirror here on the wall and see a man, a new man, clean before God and ready to serve. What should I call myself? My impulse is to start fresh, be someone completely brand new, but it isn't quite right that way. Everything before this moment matters. It all adds up to now. Malcolm was my name as a child. I am no longer a child. Little was a slaveholder's name. I am no longer a slave. I was Shorty's homeboy and Sammy's Detroit Red, but now I belong to God. It is his voice with which I wish to be renamed now. I listen and listen until I know. I am my father's son. My way through the world has been paved by him. His challenges, his choices, all bequeathed to me. These things are hard to hold, but I see my life more clearly now. I'm not meant to be part of the things that are wrong with this world, but neither am I meant to run from them. I'm meant to fight against them. I can't hold my own in the ring, but out in the world, I do know how to fight, with words, with truth. Everything that I've lived through this has been part of my fight. My father's God, my mother's God, my brother's God. They are one, they are in me. I am my father's son, still and always. He named me, and I will carry that name, just as I carry a part of him. What I don't want is the stamp of the white world on me. That I must fight against, throw off the shackles of past ugliness, buck myself free, for that too is Papa's legacy and something I must carry. I bend down and sign the letter to Elijah, Malcolm X. The guards may come for me, the devil may come, the chains and the darkness, all the wrongs of the world may come, the noose, every force that thirsts for the destruction of the black man in America. I am my father's son. They will always come for me, but I will never succumb. And so it speaks to young men who are lost, who have been beaten by society that says that they are something that they are not. And um, it shows that once you accept who you are, sometimes we, we find young men who are pained, they don't know who their fathers are, or their fathers are in their lives and they don't have a good relationship. But that all of that doesn't matter, that once we understand that we are uh, worthy of love, that we are worthy of a quality education, that we, are, we have the power to be great leaders, that that's what this book is all about for young adults. So there you have it. Thank you. I think if his father had lived, if his 
family was remained intact. That all of the teachings that they had instilled in him, the foundation that they had provided, would have been nurtured. And so, if your if your family says you're beautiful, you're great, you can be anything that you want, up up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. But then you go out into society and your father is not there and your mother is not there to encourage that. And you're still young when this, you know, with, 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 with all of this happening, that you can lose sense of yourself. But the fortunate part is that the foundation is there. And so I know even for my mother, it was very important to her to make sure that we understood who we were as women, as people of the African diaspora, and as Muslims because each one of those you know, is looked down upon in society. The value of a woman, the value to be of the African ancestry and the value of Islam. So my mother made sure that when we left the home that, and we would confront these kinds of challenges that, say, that says, that does not respect our human dignity, that we already understood our value, our worth. So I think for my father, having lost his father at a young age, that, um, you know, being angered, he didn't know what happened to his father. All he knew was that his father was gone. And his mother being taken away, you know. It's gotta be some anger and pain. And then not believing in yourself, not believing that black lives don't matter and not being respected, his human dignity not being respected, and then falling into what society says you should be without anyone there to say that is not who you are. And so I think once he was finally able um, to have a quiet moment and be forced to confront whatever, those demons, you know, that he was able to say, you know, black is good, you know, and that's why the, 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 the message of the Nation of Islam was appealing to him and his brothers, you know, because it gave them a history, it gave them a religion, a religion that they could look to, you know. Yes, this gentleman here. Um, I wasn't quite three, so I was a, a little baby. You know, I, I, this is what I think is so wonderful about my mother. She maintained the stories. When I was a child, I used to have cookies with my father. So she kept those stories going. And sometimes, you know, when I go to college campuses, I joke about it because when I first really heard this particular story about the cookies, um, my girlfriends that were with me, we were at an event in Washington and my mother was telling the story, they were all like, <gasps> You know, because everybody knew I had this distinct connection with cookies, you know, and it was because I used to share them with my father when he would come home. And so when he was killed, I would go to the door. We were staying at the Poitier, Sydney Poitier's house. And I would go to the door and I would look for my father. And so she would take a cookie and she'd break it and she'd leave it on a plate. And so I became addicted to cookies, you know. And so then, you know, we talk about gluten free cookies versus the cookies back then. Where you know, you keep eating cookies, you get wider and wider, but fortunately today, you know, you can have cookies that are gluten-free and then you encourage young people to eat all the cookies that they can while they're young, you know, when their metabolism is, is really, really high. But my, my mother was really great, you know, she kept his coat, his briefcase, his books, his shoes. You know, my father was 6'5", and so sometimes I would put my, I mean, my sisters also, we would, you know, play with his shoes, we'd put our feet in the shoes and clunk around the house. And we'd see our father's hat, we, the briefcase, and just his things. And she talked about him all the time. She talked to him, yeah, about daddy, the things that he'd like, he wouldn't like. Um, so, you know, we wouldn't feel that our father abandoned us. Yeah. Until I was, you know, at a certain age, learning about the phenomena of single parent households versus two parent households. And realizing that I didn't think I fell into the, you know, that, yeah, and realizing that I didn't grow up with my father. <laughs> Speaking 
to my, my father's siblings and also being able to relate um, it to my nephew. And uh, you know, when, when my nephew was alive, he would always say to me, Auntie, you know, I feel like you know, my life is like my, my grandfather's. And you know, I'm thinking, your life is nothing like your grandfather's. But then realizing that it, it was. And so there are lots of young men you know, who have that challenge. But for my nephew, you know, saying that I grew up in the streets of Harlem when he went to private school and did all these things <laughs> with, with his grandmother, you know, he traveled the world with his grandmother. But when he got to a certain age, you know, he wanted to say, oh, I grew up in the streets of Harlem, and he didn't grow up in the streets of Harlem. And so I knew that even for my father, um, you know, speaking to my cousin, um, his, si his half-sister's son, you know, said, are you kidding? Malcolm used to read, you know, even during the time when he was in Boston. So I had to, I came to understand, you know, if you live someplace like in the sticks, in the upstate, in the very rural area, and then you, you know, you say in New York, for example, you live up in Albany, right? And then you, you know, you travel somewhere and you say, I'm from New York, they immediately think you're from 42nd Street or the South Bronx, and Albany is this like, you know, hick not really hick town, but it's not, you know, it's nothing like New York City. So I, I, you know, got to really understand Lansing was so flat. To see Boston was like, wow. But when you read the book, you think that it's this dark, gr grimy, greasy place. And it wasn't. It was a place of lights and excitement by comparison to, you know, the hick, the hick town where he was from. My father had a great sense of humor. He was very loving, very passionate, um, obviously. Uh, and what I understand is that my mother was, was the tough one. You know, that it wasn't my father who was so tough, but that my mother was tough. And, and um, you know, I, even realizing or, or well, realizing that he was only in his 20s, you know, when the world learned of Malcolm X and, and he was 39 when he was assassinated, and so that's such a young age to have made the impact that he made, global impact that he made, and, you know, to, such a selfless act, you know, to travel the world searching for solutions, you know, so that we could be more brotherly and sisterly with one another. Yeah, he was at a comparable age when he did this famous thing, late 30s, and um, he lived, but but very quietly from that point on. He's still alive. He's in his early mid 80s now, and you'll sometimes see him pop up on the news because, well, he people are reminded of him when they, when Edward Snowden and the other leaker stories of recent years have become big news again, and they said, oh yeah, it was the first guy to do this, the first guy to really, the blockbuster kind of whistleblower story was. Ellsberg, and I think they had to look him up and find out where he was. And he's in Berkeley and still with Patricia and living very quietly. I mean, they spent their life doing peace marches and anti-nuclear rallies, arrested many times, but very quietly. Yes, they had one, one son, and he's just now, I think, I mean, it, it's amazing to talk to him. He's still very feisty, very, very political. And I think he's uh, he's not happy about what's going on. He sees parallels, obviously, but he's happy to be spoken to again and remembered and have a chance to get back out there. Yeah, he's still very, very articulate about his point, his point of view, about our need to really know and get involved in what our leaders are doing. Yeah. I just like great stories, and sometimes they are a little bit better known and sometimes not. But there's something to that, too. I mean, like I said, I started out working in this textbook world, which is just the books that they create are, are just terrible. 
and just convince young readers that history is boring and just something to memorize. Just the opposite of the kind of stories that you're hearing here. And, uh, so no, I do look for the story first. And if it can be something that nobody knows, like the Port Chicago story that I could tell, so much the better, because then I can go out and every time I tell it, if it's 10, if it's 100 people, maybe they'll read up a little more about it or tell somebody else about it. And, and uh, But that story in particular, was, it, they're still going on. You know, We're seeing the Ellsberg story still going on with the Port Chicago story. Those 50 men were all convicted of mutiny and all lived their lives as convicted mutineers. And as far as we know, none is still alive, but their families are still working to get the Navy or it has to probably come from the Navy to exonerate or overturn those convictions. We've recently sent a letter to President Obama. And, um, so maybe there'll be some movement on it, but it's still going. And that's the kind of story I get most interested in. Thank you.